Hello and welcome to another PMP Live. Tonight's event features Rita Dove in conversation with Adrian Sue and is in partnership with the Hurston Wright Foundation. We'll be hearing some poems from Rita's first volume of poetry in 12 years, Playlist for the Apocalypse, which is available for pre-order and purchase on our website, on our website and is in store on August 17th. If at any point in tonight's event you have any questions for our poets, you're welcome to use our Q&A feature. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of tonight's conversation. Our apologies in advance if we don't get to yours. My pleasure to introduce tonight Rita Dove, Pulitzer Prize winner and former U.S. Poet Laureate. And she's the only poet honored with both the National Humanities Medal and the National Medal of Arts. Her recent works include Playlist of the Apocalypse, Sonata Melodica, and the National Book Award shortlisted Collected Poems 1974 to 2004. In 2021, she was awarded the Gold Medal for Poetry from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She lives in Charlottesville, where she teaches creative writing at the U University of Virginia. Adrian Sue is the author of five books of poems, most recently Peach State, which was published in March 2021. Sue's awards include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Pushcart Prize, a Money for Women, Barbara Deming Foundation Grant, and residencies at Yaddo McDowell, the Virginia Center for His Creative Arts, among others. Since 2000, she has taught creative writing at Dickinson College, where she is poet in residence. Sue's book, Peach Day, is also available for purchase online or in our store. All of the links for purchases will be posted in our chat. Thank you, and whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be back at Politics and Prose and uh, looking forward to your questions and to talking with Adrian Sue, who is a dear, dear friend and a wonderful poet. So I'm sure we're gonna have a good time. Uh, I thought what I would do was to start with a poem, two poems actually, that are uh, centered or set in the town that I live in. We're all pretty much going back into shelter or trying to get used to this, notion that we will have to go back into shelter. And where I am right now is Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, the home of the University of Virginia. And of course, which was of course built by Thomas Jefferson, that most conflicted of American souls. And uh, this first poem is called Bell Ringer. Now the Bell Ringer at the University of Virginia was a mulatto man by the name of Henry Martin in his job uh, back uh, in the 19th century was to ring the hours. Uh, there are some questions about whether he was in fact uh, uh, another one of, uh, of, of Jefferson's progeny or not. But the fact is that he was very light skinned that he died. Um, he was born on the same day that Jefferson died. Bell ringer. I was given a name. It came out of a book. I don't know which. I've been told the great man could recite every title in order on its shelf. Well, I was born and that's a good thing. Although I arrived on the day of his passing, a day on which our country fell into mourning. This I heard over and over from professors to farmers, even dual scarred students. Sometimes in grand company remarked upon in third person, a pretty way of saying more than two men in a room means the third can be ignored, as I was when they spoke of my birth and Mr. Jefferson's death in one breath, voices dusted with wonderment, faint sunlight quivering on a hidden breeze. I listen in on the lectures whenever I can holding still until I disappear beyond third person. And what I hear sounds right enough. It eases my mind. I know my appearance frightens some of the boys, the high cheeks and freckles and not quite Negro eyes flaring gray as storm washed skies back home. It shames them to be reminded. So much for book learning. I nod as if to say, Uncle Henry, at your service, then continue on my way through darkness to start the day. 
this is my place, stone rookery perched above the citadels of knowledge, alone with the bats and my bell, keeping time. Up here, molten glory brims until my head's rinsed clear. I am no longer a dreadful coincidence, nor debt crossed off in a dead man's ledger. I am not summoned, dismissed. I am the clock's keeper. I ring in their ears. And every hour down in that shining blistered republic, someone will pause to whisper, Henry. And for a moment, my name flies free. Uh, as you know, Charlottesville has been in the news um, and a sleepy college town woken up to its, to its own um, shames and blames and, and problems as all of us should be in a way. Uh, this poem occurs right before the statues that were the cause uh, or the center, the epicenter of all this, of, of the unrest and the tragedies here recently were finally removed. Pedestrian crossing, Charlottesville. A gaggle of girls giggle over the bricks leading off court square. We break dutifully and wait, but there's at least 20 of these knob-kneed creatures, blonde and curly, still at an age that thinks impudence is cute. Look how they dart and dither, changing flanks as they lurch along, golden gobbets of infuriating foolishness or pure joy, depending on one's disposition. At the moment, mine's sour, this is taking far too long. Don't they have minders? Just behind my shoulder in the city park, the Southern General still stands, stonewalling us all. When I was their age, I judged Goldilocks nothing more than a pint-sized criminal who flounced into others' lives, then assumed their clemency. Unfair, I know, my aggression. To lump them into a gaggle, silly geese, when all they're guilty of is being young, so far. It's, um, it's a strange thing to, to drive by uh, the, those statues every day on the way to other things. And, and somehow even stranger to drive by the void now. I mean, there's a, it's, it's as if the problem's solved, but it really isn't, is it? I and mean, it's just partly taken away and put aside. I hope that we'll all be able to do what happens in this next poem. This is a family reunion. And in my family, that always meant that you would um, convene over the barbecue pit in the grill. And the extended family, which is all, uh, most of my extended family is in Northern Ohio, in Akron and in Cleveland. But since the families came up as part of the great migration in the twenties, uh, there are certain characteristics that are distinctly Southern that still remain with us. Family reunion. 30 seconds into the barbecue, my Cleveland cousins have everyone speaking Southern. Broadened vowels and dropped consonants, whoops and calls. It's more osmosis than magic. A sliding thrall back to a time when working the tire factories meant entire neighborhoods coming up from Georgia or Tennessee, accents helplessly intact. While their children, inflections flattened to match the field they thought they were playing on, knew without asking when it was safe to roll out a drawl. Just as it's understood pot luck means resurrecting the food we've abandoned along the way for the sake of sleeker thighs. I look over the yard to the porch with this battalion of aunts, the wavering ranks of uncles at the grill. Everywhere else, hordes of progeny, 
are swirling and my cousins yakking on as if they were waist deep in quicksand, but like the books recommend aren't moving until someone hauls them free. Who are all these children? Who had them and with whom? Through the general coffee tones, the shamed genetics cut a creamy swath. Cherokees burnt umber transposed onto generous lips, a glance flares gray above the crushed nose. We label anonymous African. It's all here. The beautiful geometry of Mendel's peas and their grim logic. And though we remain clearly divided on the merits of okra, there's still time to demolish the cheese grits and tear into slow cooked ribs so tender we agree they're worth the extra pound or two our menfolk swear will always bring them home. Pity the poor soul who lives a life without butter. Those pinched knees and tennis shoulders and hatchety smiles. Ah, um, I have been just longing to have some ribs. It's really interesting. It's one of the things that I haven't had a chance to eat, I guess, uh, or I haven't made because when you make ribs, you make them for a group of people, you make them for a lot of folks. And it's been just my husband and myself. And so you forego things like that. The little things that, uh, that we're missing. Uh, let, let me skip a bit. I'm going to, first of all, I should show you the cover of the book, um, Playlist for the Apocalypse, which is, uh, the cover is actually compliments of my daughter who took the photograph, not thinking that it was going to end up on a book, but um, so I want to thank her for that. This uh, the, the the next two poems are are interesting in that they are they're based on form. Um, this first one is called a found sonnet, the wig, and in the tradition that grand tradition of found poems, it uh, every word of it has come from a description of some kind of wig. Found sonnet, the wig. 100% human hair, natural, yaki synthetic Brazilian blend, Malaysian, Kanekalon, Peruvian virgin, pure Indian, iron friendly, heat resistant, bounce, volume, featherweight, short and sassy, swirls and twirls, smooth and sleek and sleek and straight. Wet and wavy, future of fiber, weave a wig or shake and go. Classic, trendy, micro kink, frosted pixie, tight cornrow, full three quarter, half stretch cap, drawstring, ear tabs, combs, chignon, headband, clip in bangs, easy extension, and ponytail domes. Long or bobbed, hand tied, layered, deep twist bulk, pre styled updo. Remy closure, Swiss lace front, invisible L part, J part, U. Feathered, fringed, extended neck, tousled, spiky, loose cascades. Side swept, flipped ends, corkscrews, spirals, rasta dreads, Ghana braids. Passion wave, silk straight, faux mohawk, Nubian locks, noble curl, Cleopatra. Vintage Vixen, Empress, Hera, Party Girl. Uh, and um, I'm gonna go to this one uh, with, a, with a little introduction to it to say that there's a group of poems in this book which are um, spoken by the Statue of Liberty, pretty much, at least from her vantage point. Uh, part of a, a project that I did with a composer, a wonderful composer by the name of Richard Daniel Poor, uh, for a song cycle. And uh, the song cycle basically takes the last, I guess, 50, 60 years of American history. Um, Richard came to me with this idea, you know, a little 
no, no small thing to do. And this poem is a villanelle and uh, it's called You're Tired, You're Poor, 1968. Who comforts you now that the wheel has broken? No more princes for the poor, loss whittling you thin. Grief is the constant now, hope the last word spoken. In a dance of two elegies, which circles the drain? A token year with its daisies and carbines is where we begin. Who comforts you now? That the wheel has broken its mechanics 101 to keep dreaming when the joke's on you? Well, crazier legends have been written. Grief is the constant now, hope the last word spoken on a hotel balcony, shouted in a hotel kitchen. No kin can make this journey for you, the roots locked in. Who comforts you now that the wheel has broken the bodies of its makers? Beyond the smoke and ashes, what you hear rising is nothing but the wind. Who comforts you? Now that the wheel has broken, grief is the constant. Hope, the last word spoken. Trayvon Redux is an epigraph from William Carlos Williams' Affidel, That Greeny Flower. It is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Hear me out, for I too am concerned in every man who wants to die at peace in his bed besides. Trayvon Redux. Move along, you don't belong here. This is what you're thinking. Thinking drives you nuts these days, all that talk about rights and law abidance when you can't even walk your own neighborhood in peace and quiet. Get your black ass gone. You're thinking again. Then what? Matlock's on TV and here you are, vigilant, weary, exposed to the elements on a wet winter's evening in Florida when all's not right, but no one sees it. Where are they? The law, the enforcers, blind as a bunch of lazy bats can be, holsters dangling from coat hooks above their desks as they jaw the news between donuts. Hey, it tastes good, shoving your voice down the throat, thinking only of sweetness. Go on, choke on that. Did you say something? Are you thinking again? Stop and get your ass gone, your black ass. That casual little red riding hood, I'm just on my way home attitude, as if this street was his to walk on. Do you hear me talking to you, boy? Boy, how dare he smile, jiggling his goodies in that tiny, shiny bag, his black paw crinkling it. How dare he tinkle their laughter at you? Here's a fine basket of riddles. If a mouth shoots off and no one's around to hear it, who can say which came first? Push or shove, bang or whimper. Which is news fit to write home about? This book is full of um, persona poems, uh, full of poems written in uh, other voices, uh, which is, uh, I think, always a convenient or an interesting way, I should say, of discovering one's own feelings by putting it through another voice. This poem, uh, however, I owe to my daughter because she, um, when she was very young, she was three or four, she used to walk around the house saying that nobody loved her but the spring cricket. And my husband and I could not figure out, uh, though we questioned her, who the spring cricket was and why he, and he was a he, deserved uh, you know, her love and not ours. So uh, I began to write poems from the point of view of the cricket. The spring cricket considers the question of negritude. 
I was playing my tunes all by myself. I didn't know anybody else who could play along. Sure, the tunes were sad, but sweet too, and wouldn't come until the day gave out. You know that way the sky has of dangling her last bright wisps? That's when the ache would bloom inside until I couldn't wait. I knelt down to scrape myself clean and didn't care who heard. Then came the shouts and whistles, the roundup into jars, a clamber of legs. Now there were others, tumbled, clouded. I didn't know their names. We were a musical lantern. Children slept to our rasping sighs. And if now and then one of us shook free and sang as he climbed to the brim, he would always fall again, which made them laugh and clap their hands. At least then we knew what pleased them and where the brink was. I'm going to, I'm skipping around, which is kind of fun to do. Um, I, I wanted to try to give you a sense of the book as a whole. And there, there are many different sections. One of the sections is called mm, Angry Odes. And in fact, the pedestrian crossing poem, poem is in that section. But I thought I would read to you the, the introductory poem to that section as well. The Angry Odes, an introduction. The Angry Odes are not satisfied with wonder. Birds prattle, clouds curdle, then bust their guts. Mountains prefer their own splendid company. Neither do they melt when music swells, although they've been caught swaying unaware in a delicate self-embrace. The odes hate their names. To hell with urns and nightingales, immortality and socks. Those artful self-immolations, pity parties fueled by gloom or a gruff enforced gaiety. They snarl at affirmation, will laugh outright when asked for declarations in return. Do not try reason. The odes are fed up with misspelled signs accusing others of ignorance, the belligerent purveyors of programmed rectitude. Let them rage. Do your work. Reap the ashes. Perhaps they'll muster a flicker of pity. Recall a time when all they did was praise. And I'm going to, I'll end with these two poems. One of them is um, slightly longer, but, but not too long. And then I will end with a poem that I owe to my students with thanks. Soup. When the doctor said, I've got good news and bad news, I thought of soup. How long it had been since I had had the homemade kind, the real deal where you soak the beans overnight and everything is apportioned in stages. First the onions and meat browned in oil, then the broth added for hours of simmering. All that saturated glistening scent, stoking the house with memories. The Jewish boy I kissed until we both sank to our knees in the grass my mother's frown as she plucked weeds from my hair. Oh, my mother will die from this. My mother whose soup is the best, even though it was always oversalted because it was labored over. It was ladled out unconditionally, tendered sweetly without consequences, a non-judicial love. And it was always soup I got first thing in the sick bed. And there's the way tomatoes are added at the last moment, but the minor vegetables, peas and corn and tiny diced potatoes come in 30 minutes before that. And how the spices, ah, the spices are to be doled out sparingly. Then waiting to see how strong they'd become in the brew, their hidden aptitudes unlocked only by time in the heat of a burbling melange. And the way my apron always got stained but I wouldn't wash it, proud of the mess for once, making mistakes, sloshing and dripping. 
Yes, soup was what I wanted. Not news, but the slow courage of the lentil as it softened, its heart splitting into wings. Not good cop, bad cop, but the swift metallic smack of too much time administered hastily, the kind of mistake you never make again. Bread too. I wanted the whole thick crusty hump of it laid out for vivisection. Here is my body, eat. And lots of red wine that always feels like it's greasing my bones with lava. Here is my blood. And then the bad news came. Whoever listens to the good? And before I answered, before the questions and the arched eyebrow of my husband standing in the doorway could fall into pity and helplessness, I thought, yes, I'll make soup tonight, a soup fit for the gods. And um, before we get to conversation questions, I'll end with this poem uh, in a way uh, of saying that what, what goes around comes around. And uh, in this case, it was a writing exercise that I traditionally give all my students, a personal writing exercise that I call the wild card and which is I, I hope feared by most of them. Uh, they never know when it's coming. It's personalized, so it's geared to to rattle their cage. And and one year, a group of students said, "Look, uh, you give us wild cards. You should uh, have one of your own." And I thought fair is fair, and so I assigned myself a wide wild card. I thought it was going to be easy. But of course it wasn't. Um, it was basically the idea of using every line in, in, within a line of the poem, every word had to start with the same letter. So there was no order given to, it didn't have to proceed like an alphabet, but one line would have only O's and one line would have only B's. And um, my, my, my belief about form for me is that you don't look for form. Uh, the form has to, you it finds you, uh, it finds your subject matter. And so as I was trying to think, well, what, this is a, a very strange form it will hobble along. Certainly it'll be self-conscious. What, what does that in my life? And I realized that I, I do have a bum knee, uh, mainly from years of uh, ballroom dancing. And so I decided to write an ode to my right knee. Oh, obstreperous one, ornery outside of ordinary protocols, paramilitary probi par excellence, every evidence you yield yells. No noise too tough to tackle, tears springing such sudden salt when walking wrenches, haranger, hag, hairy, hanger on, how much more maddening insidious imperfection. Membranes matter-of-factly corroding, crazed cartilage calmly chipping away as another arduous ambulation begins bone bruising bone. Leathery lothario, lone laboring gladiator grappling, groveling for favor. Fair weather forecaster, fickle friend, jive jiggy joint, kindly keep kicking. I thank you all for listening. And now I think Adrian is gonna be popping in and we're gonna have a little talk before the questions come from the audience. That's the plan. Thank all you right. for the gorgeous reading. I've been, I've been dwelling in this book and it's just such a treat to hear the words in your voice now. Thank you. I'm going to start with a question about the book broadly. Playlist for the Apocalypse is a double-edged title. A lot in the book is apocalyptic, but there's also a lot of play. Mm -hmm. There's that fabulous alliteration 
uh, that we heard in Pedestrian Crossing and also, of course, in Ode to My Right Knee. And there's the joyousness, really, of Found Sonnet, the wig. And uh, the Villanelle is a playful form, even though writing one is anything but play, really. <laughs> um, can you talk about how you keep the sense of play in your work, uh, whether the subject matter is heavy or not? Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, this this is a great question because uh, I think that that somehow my whole life I've had a running mantra of you know laughing just to keep from crying. That old that old motto that that you 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 can that our comedians are perhaps the most depressed group of people in the, in the, in the in, you know, in our populace and that we need humor in order to buoy us uh, when things become absolutely uh, unbearable. And I think that um, you, the title, I'm gonna back up and go to that first and then talk about the, the play and the words, but the, the title was also thought out that way in the sense that an apocalypse can be something could be the end of days, but it also can be a revelation. Uh, that's what the word really means. And a playlist, as you said, of course, is it's, it contains the word play, but it, in this sense, the playlist is anything but playful. Um, the, the entire notion of having a playlist for the apocalypse. But, um, and, and so that, that idea of, 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 of having a way in which to bear it all, and how do we bear it? As a writer, um, as a poet, particularly, my medium is language, my medium are words, and to be able to meld them, to be able to play with them, and to push them in, in against, uh, you know, kind of a form like a villain now, is also part of the, of, of my salvation, in a way, you know, uh, I, how do you write about the assassinations that happened in 1968, when another time when we thought that the world was coming you know, to an end because it was just incredible how much violence and how much tragedy there was in this country. And uh, the Villanelle seemed absolutely right for that. And, and, but, but working through that Villanelle helped me bear that, that anguish. And uh, yes, there are playful things, but even the, in the play helps us uh, the, you know, you, you, I don't know, I feel, always feel like you, you have to be able to smile sometimes too. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the epigraph you included with Trayvon Redux and um, maybe it's because my question is about news that consuming news is almost the opposite of consuming poems and you clearly do both. Mm -hmm. I mean, one has to if you're a poet, or you even if you don't write about the news, you just need to know what's going on in the world. Um, there are such different relationships to language. I'm curious about how you balance your reading diet. Ooh, <laughs> my reading diet. Well, you know, I read, I guess it comes from when I was a child and was allowed to, to kind of roam through the bookshelves at home and read anything I want without anyone saying, well, you know, that's too old for you or something. Like that. So I just, I devoured it all. And I loved, I loved uh, the trash as well as the good stuff. I mean, I, I read comic books and then I would read Shakespeare. So my reading diet is very strange. I, I tend to have a book in every room and I'll pick it up as I go through the room. So, so, um, for instance, uh, you know, I, I I love to read detective fiction, and that's to just take the edge off. My reading diet, I read poetry in a certain like chair and a half because I can curl up with it. And and um, I, I'd love to read, I just, I don't know, I love to get lost in a book. And for me, and that can happen in so many different kinds of books. Like, for instance, right now, the book that I'm reading is a book called Shape and it's um, by by Jordan Ellenberg. It's a book about geometry and he's a math guy and he's talking about how we use um, geometry and all the subtitle is so great. I have the hidden geometry of information, biology, strategy, democracy, and everything else. And you know, if you take if you push yourself 
beyond your comfort level and your, you know, the, your wheelhouse, it, it can somehow just be illuminating. So my diet is very varied and very strange. I like it. Well, it obviously works, <laughs> so it's, but it was very nice to hear about that. Um, you mentioned Charlottesville and Charlottesville being in the news. It's also been your home for many years. Um, and I was lingering over pedestrian crossing uh, in part because it doesn't mention the events of August 2017, but they're, they're there. Mm -hmm. And I feel that they're even more present because of the poem's conversation with the other poems in the collection, which also address racial violence in Birmingham, in Ferguson, I know Charlottesville doesn't want to become a metonym for this, uh, mm -hmm. but could you talk about how setting a poem in Charlottesville now is different from some years ago? Uh -huh, yes. Well, the, because, you know, Charlottesville for me has always been my uh, a kind of a, a refuge. It's a place, it's my home, but it's also a place where, uh, you know, it sounds like Mayberry, you know, you some people, you, you smile and people smile back and there was no traffic to speak of. And, and it was a place where I could go to rest in a way uh, so that my mind could live. And I think that many people, uh, especially on the, 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 the gown side of town, because in any small college town, there's going to be that, there is that divide. Uh, but a lot of people on the gown side felt that this was a place of intellectual uh, liberation, I guess you could say. Uh, preferring to, I, I think that the racial problems and the, and the divides and the problems of, of poverty here are there, they're here, they're desperate. They're definitely here. They're not as strong as in other urban environments, and so that people felt that they were safe. And uh, I, I, I remember when I first came to Charlottesville uh, to teach at the university. One of the things that that has always kept me kind of sitting up straight in my seat is the fact that this is the this is a kind of crossroads of, of the United States. You had you have the Confederacy right down there, you know, in Richmond. Then you have Washington DC up there. You have uh, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington DC and you have the Jefferson Monument and you have Monticello of course and then you have the university and as I mentioned before you've got Thomas Jefferson who is just you know all of it put together, it just seemed to be represent the kind of split personality that this country has. That was always there. Now it has come to light with this, with this incredible tragedy, which um, um, took everyone, I think, here by surprise because they had gotten complacent. It is so different to write a poem now because now everyone in the world outside of Charlottesville knows the name. You say Charlottesville and they go, ooh, and they perk up. It makes a, writing a poem like Charlotte's, a pedestrian crossing Charlottesville automatically loads the poem uh, with, with all those shadows, uh, you know, the things. So it's, it's there. Um, and yeah, which is one reason why in this poem is not placed next to the Trayvon Martin poem, for instance, mm -hmm. but later in the book, um, because it that shadow was over us all all the time. It's it's not it's too easy to say to put all of our fears and all of our biases and the problems we have into one section one ghetto, if one wants to say, you know, but it's everywhere. So I really wanted to keep it separate. Great, thanks. Um, you mentioned that there are lots of persona poems in this yeah. in this collection, and I, I love the range of them. And of course, the, the angry odes and introduction gave me that same double response of, this is serious. But the poem's also really funny. It's 
taking these swipes at Keats and Neruda. <laughs> and, um, I, I think, again, it's, it's doing this sort of magical thing of laughing and crying at the same time. Hmm. You often find a point of view or a consciousness that was there, but nobody noticed it before. Uh, the spring cricket is another of those. Hmm. And I wonder, is this something you work at or is it just who you are? Is it just a gift? <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. You know, it, it's not something that, I, that I, I consciously strive to do, but I do think that being part of a, of, of a marginalized group, and I guess that would be not only being African-American, but being a woman, uh, I think I grew up always watching um, from the sidelines. And there's another poem in there called From the Sidelines, actually, uh, that, that, and also I was very shy. So I wasn't going to be the person in you know, the center of the party. But, uh, but, but if you sit on the sidelines and you watch, you see all sorts of things. So that's part of my, actually my point of view. That's part of the way that I, that I look at the world. Uh, and uh, I do think that one of the things that happened in terms of getting this book to come together for me, oddly enough, was the fact that we had this pandemic because that uh, suddenly I was at home, all events were canceled. I did not travel. I did not have to be in a spotlight. And that meant I could be on the sidelines, but severe sidelines, but I was sidelines and also in myself. And I could then write these poems. You mentioned the angry odes that, you know, of course, if, I adore, you know, the odes of, um, you know, Keats and, and, and Neruda, which is why I took a swipe at them, uh, because we shouldn't adore anything so much that it freezes us. And that was, you know, and I think that the angry odes were also, they came about because because of the uh, assonance of angry odes on the one hand and on the other hand, I was just, I found myself getting so angry at, at the way the world was running and th that I could do nothing about it. That helplessness made me so furious. And so I decided to, well, if I can't take a swipe at the world, I'll take a swipe at my own profession. I'll take a swipe at odes. <laughs> Right. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to switch to some audience questions. Okay. Uh, so here is one. Can you please share any authors, poems, or poetic lineages that you feel have particularly prepared you for living and writing in this moment in history? Ooh, wow, that's an amazing question because especially at this moment in history. And, and, and though I, I, I've I've talked about this and I've said that, you know, that Shakespeare got me started and Plath, you know, fired me up and, and Hughes kept me, you know, moving with the, you know, with the, the spirit of the times. I find that um, the poems of Muriel Rukeyser have been, I, I don't know what it is. They have really helped me through this. And June Jordan and uh, the, Hmm. What else? Oddly enough, um, yeah, in this particular time, uh, yeah, oddly enough, uh, the poems of Bertolt Brecht and his plays for their, their this, there's a, uh, a way he has, it's, it's almost nihilistic, but at the same time, he does care deeply, which is why he's so scathing. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps a lot. It helps a lot. Uh, it's interesting because I would have answered this question differently five years ago. I would have mentioned, for instance, uh, who I really adore, I would have mentioned um, Robert Hayden. I would have talked about um, well, I'll just, just leave it at that. But, but at the moment, I am even angrier than that. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, at the moment, mm -hmm. I, I need some uh, someone who is going to help me through, uh, in a way, this apocalypse. So, yeah. Okay. 
here's another question. And this is a, a slightly different topic. I understand that you are a cellist. Do you still play and does music play a part in the sound and rhythm of your poems? Do you listen to music while you write? Wow. Well, let me say first of all that I um, do not play still, unfortunately. I've, um, I have, when I talk about this in the book, I have um, for the past 20 years struggled with MS. And one of the consequences of that, though it's well under control right now, thank goodness, is that I've lost a lot of the feeling in my fingertips and my toes, but um, which is why I dance because the toe, uh, having lost that, that feeling, I learned my balance through dance, but I have a great difficulty playing any instrument because it, it irritates the, the neuropathy in the fingers. However, I do sing, I love, um, I, I do, music is all through the, the poems. I can't, write a poem if it doesn't sing in some way. It may be an ugly song, but you know, but it, it has to have that rhythm. Um, that was part of the real joy of doing a poem like Found Sonnet because I found this music and all of these phrases which were meant to be descriptive. And But I don't play music when I write. And that's interesting. It, it would just get in my way. I had, the, the, the poem is the music, okay. I'll play it afterwards. Mm. Right. Let's see, another question. Any thoughts about how to write a political poem, poems about current events that are more poetic and avoid polemics? What do you keep in mind? That's a really good question because it is the, it is the real dilemma. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons, if we take a poem like Pedestrian Crossing, for instance, um, the, the fact that it does not mention the um, the tragedies that have happened here and the and the the events that August is in a, in a way you know my failure at being able to write directly about that moment it is the problem with writing political poems is that the I think human beings are kind of wired for self-defense and we will shut off feeling if the if the if the thing being talked about is too difficult if it makes us too sad if it if it's too overwhelming we will shut off our feeling so there's as a writer you have to figure out a way to make it come so alive that they can't you know get away from it um it, it, one way of doing that is is perhaps to adopt personas. And when I say to take a persona, not the easy ones, but the hard ones, you know, not the not the person who's fighting for right, but the person like in the Trayvon Martin poem that I read, you know, the perpetrator of the violence, you know, the criminal, because that both gives you a, it's, it's a different way of looking at it. You don't have to, you don't want to fall into a slot, you know, where you're just running along with everyone else. You want to get a different view. The spring cricket poems do that as well. They take a, a very unlikely subject, uh, I mean, speaker, a, a cricket, and, uh, you know, lets the cricket comment on things. Uh, that that can help. But details, details are where are going to be your, your saving grace when writing a political poem. What color was the blouse that you saw as it went, you know, disappeared behind the phalanx of clubs, for instance? That those details will keep it anchored. I think this next question is related to this question. Okay. What is your process for transcending facts and the mundane and transforming them into the poetic? Ooh, ooh. It is a constant, constant uh, thing that one works with, and there's no, there's no method, there's no way of, of um, I can't tell you, you know, just oh, this is the way you do it. One, two, three. Every poem is different. There are poems where, um, and, and well, first of all, let me just say that I think that to 
what's important is to not think of anything as mundane, you know, to accord everything its moment of, of, of wonder. Uh, Neruda did that, of course, famously. He wrote odes on everything, odes to olives, to the liver, you know, and, and he makes them come alive. So, so that is one way to do it. If you think something is mundane, write about it write about, look at it and describe it absolutely, you know, or, or write from its point of view or fall in love with it, but, but give it its moment, let it shine in and of itself. Once that happens, there's nothing mundane and uh, you don't fall into that, that feeling of just thinking, oh, everything's all right. So true. Yeah. Uh it's crazy. So here's a poem specific question. Hmm. What a treat. Thank you for reading us some of your work. My question is about your poem, Lady Freedom Among Us. Does it resonate differently with you over time or is it very rooted for you in the time it was written? Ah, yes, that poem, thank you for that question. That poem, Lady Freedom Among Us was uh, written uh, and, uh, around 1994, I think. And I did read it. Uh, at the Capitol, it was the celebration of the laying of the uh, the two hundredth anniversary of the laying of the cornerstone of the Capitol building, and and Lady Freedom, who stands on the top of the Capitol building, the dome had been taken down for cleaning. So uh, it it it's interesting because I think at the time, whenever I would read that poem and when I wrote it, I was filled with hope. I was filled with this hope, uh, even though the poem does say, you know, that uh, Lady Freedom needed cleaning and she's she's a homeless person kind of, and you know, it, it, the poem is admonishing you not to walk by freedom. But, but now I feel less, I feel less hopeful. I feel that it's the warning part of that poem comes out to me a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this thank you for that question a playlist for the apocalypse just couldn't be better timed i hope <laughs> we don't have more apocalypses coming up <laughs> i hope so too maybe we can have a playlist for the i don't know for the party just for <laughs> yes. a dance right <laughs> um here's a, a a question uh that um i'm eager to hear the answer to your poems are beautiful. Would you please tell us about process and whether and how revision is done? Wow. Well, first of all, yes, revision is done. It is done and it's done and it's done over and over. In fact, I kind of revel in re revision. I guess I'm a, a classic nerd in that sense in that I love the part where I'm just ripping things apart and looking and changing, wondering if a comma or some I call, I can really get into that. My process is very strange, I think, um, in that I tend to work in fragments, meaning that I keep poems, um, that there'll be a line here in a notebook or a, a, maybe even a whole half of a stanza or something. And uh, lots of these fragments accumulate. I keep them in files. Uh, the files are, in colored pocket folders to pocket folders so that I don't have to categorize the poems by saying before it's finished, you know, by saying, oh, this is a poem about this. I can just say this is, I, when I look at this poem, I feel red. You know, I, if I saw, I'll put it in the red folder, I'll put it in the yellow folder or the blue folder. Um, and then sometimes they move. Uh, that means that if I go into work and I do try to work every night, um, sometimes I go in with a burning, you know, thing I want to work on. Sometimes I don't. I don't know what I want to work on, but I might say, I want to go to the blue folder. I feel that. And then pretty often, you know, that I'll discover the scraps that I need. And then they go, the poems gradually accrue and get paper clipped. And so a lot of times what will happen is that I ha have nothing uh, but fragments for a long time. And then over a period of like two weeks or so, suddenly there are a whole bunch of poems come together. That's a 
great feeling uh, that I'm writing and writing, crossing out and just kind of living with the poems. Uh, so that's how I work. I said I, I work every night because I am a night, I am such a night person. Um, I usually work from about midnight to six. And it's just wonderful to be able to go to bed when the sun comes up. I've always been this way. It's not because of the quiet or, or anything like that. It's just because my body likes, wakes up at night. So that's, if I can do it, that's what I do. Fantastic. All right. So I think um, our time has not quite come for the event, but I'm going to collapse these two questions into one so that we will end on time. Um, how do you decide your approach to difficult subjects? And you don't pull your punches, expressing your anger readily. You also include humor and lightness in some of your poems. How do you work out the balance between seriousness and lightness? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know, uh... I, you know, the, as I, I was talking before about form and about how the form finds you and you don't go looking for it. And I think that when the, the anger or the, the, the feeling, you know, that uh, intense feeling, I guess you could say, um, which often can render us speechless, right? Regardless of whether it's love or hate or fury, um, usually you start to sputter. And that's what my notebooks are for. That's where I make notes on things. I often will, will make a note about something. And then uh, one way of trying to get around, get into it is to just research, like, you know, research to death, find out everything and to follow every tangent. If an event is, has overpowered me, such as, um, oh, let's just say such as the, um, well, we'll go back to pedestrian crossing, but um, then, you know, suddenly I got into geese and I started researching everything about geese. Not very little of that got into the poem, but it took my mind, it rested it so that it could grapple with the thing at hand. The other way of dealing with that is, is of course, to, to work on making sure that the language is, is giving, is orchestrating the kind of reading that I want the reader to have when I'm not around so that they breathe at the same time that I want them to breathe so that they can feel restless or breathless or calm when I want them to feel. And that, that's a matter of white space and lines and whether a word is mellifluous or, or ragged or you know commas and semicolons, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's part of it, yes. And, uh, you know, thank you actually for saying that I don't pull any punches. I'm, I'm glad, I'm so happy that you, you think that and because that's my intention. I think many people have over the years felt that I, I'm a polite poet and, you know, I can be polite, <laughs> but I don't have to be all the time. <laughs> Aisha, how are we on time? You have about two minutes. All right. Well, this here's a here's a question um, that might be done in two minutes. Is there an actual recipe for soup, and would you share it? <laughs> I feel like the sense of smell would add a whole different dimension to that poem that I want to capture. <laughs> That's so great. Um, is there a recipe? No, there is no one recipe for soup, but I have, I have made the way my mother made soup and the way I tend to make soup is, is really a kind of catch as catch can. You put in that soup everything that things that you have available. And it, and it, it is, it's, it is a, a poetic thing because you know, you, you taste it and then you wait and then you, so there is no recipe. I mean, you could follow this. I mean, this is the order of making a good soup. Um, and uh, I, but um, no, that was the, also the kind of wonderfully infuriating thing about uh, practically all of my mother's recipes was that there was none. <laughs> and you just had to watch her and you had to learn to understand the meat that you're putting in. And to understand what that, you know, what those, what that 
spice was going to do in the tomatoes. And once you understand it, then you know, oh, I did need a little red wine here. It's a very strange thing, but it's a wonderful thing. So I'm sorry that I can't give you a recipe. This is more, more of a, a vegetable soup with beef in it because we always had beef and tomatoes, but, but not too, do not use too much time. That is really the danger. It is that T-H-Y-M-E, that kind of time. Uh, that stuff is really potent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh yes. yeah. You made me so hungry and so <laughs> inspired and so excited at the same time. <laughs> well, it's um, dinner time, so everyone can go find a soup. Go. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, Rita, for your reading and for Adrian um, for the questions that you brought us. I feel like we got such a great sense of the book and the poems that you've been working on. Um, thank you to our audience as well for the questions that you posed. Um, and for everybody, the book is available for pre-order. It comes out next week on Tuesday, August 17th. And you can pre-order it on our website or come into our stores next week. Yes, I do have my early copy and the cover is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. All right, that is it from all of us. We hope you all stay well and stay well read. Thank you all. Thank you.